16 by 9, the bigger picture. A Canadian is killed in her Dominican Republic home. Does the trail of evidence lead back to Canada? I saw Louisa, she was on the floor. And when I touched her, I saw she was cold, like she was dead, like many hours before, you know. He told me that um, everything that happened to her, she deserved that. She deserved to pay. Based on what I've seen, I still re remain confident that it's still a very solvable case. That's all coming up on 16 by 9. Here's Mary Garofalo. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. Louise Gaudreau left her life in Canada for the sunshine, beaches and tranquility of the Dominican Republic. But that peace was shattered when she was brutally and mysteriously murdered. But there's a twist and 16 by 9 exposes a trail leading back to Canada. Our Robin Gill tonight with a story about murder in paradise. It's a place called Cabarete in the Dominican Republic, a paradise of sunshine, warm winds and peaceful waters. It's the place that enchanted Quebec native Louise Gaudreau. Louise came 25 years ago, leaving her life in Canada behind. Here it's like a big family, the village, everybody knows everybody and even when you go to Cabarete, everybody knows everybody. The Montreal native bought a horse ranch and raised her son Tommy here. They had acres and acres of farmland. The hilly fields were a perfect place to raise horses for tourists to ride. She lived for her horses and for her animals and for me. Ready to go. Louise's best friend, Natalie Bizio, says she always fit in with the people here. She was like a Dominican girl. She was fitting the place. She even became known as Louisa, the Spanish version of Louise. The community embraced her as she embraced them. But that took a terrible turn on April 2nd, 2010, Good Friday. On that morning at 7 a.m., two ranch hands arrived for work at Louise's farm. When the workers called out to Louise, there was no answer. The door to the house was open, so they went inside. There was still no sign of Louise. Then they pulled aside the curtain to the bathroom and discovered Louise lying face down on the floor, stabbed to death. Not knowing what to do, the workers called her best friend. Natalie rushed to the ranch. What she saw is burned forever in her mind. I saw Louise as she was on the floor in the, in the bathroom, you know, and, and when I touched her, I saw she was cold and, you know, like she was, she was not here anymore, like she was dead like many hours before, you know, and I didn't know why because I didn't see anything. And then I opened here and I saw the, the cut from the knife here, here and here and this, uh, I couldn't believe it. The awful truth sank in. Her vibrant, energetic friend was dead. It's difficult for me, you know. But it's life, no? Because she really was my best friend. And when I come back here, it's difficult for me. And uh, she was really the best people I know here. The day before, Louise told her friends and the staff she was going to turn in early. The last of the tourists riding horses left at 4 p.m. A police report concludes Louise was killed sometime between 5 p.m. and midnight. So someone entered the house that night, and it seems that person knew the farm. Nobody heard the security dogs bark, and the door was unlocked. I know Louise, she always closed the door. She never opens the door to somebody she doesn't know. Even me, when I come in the night or in the evening, she doesn't open the door. She asks, who is it? Dominican police quickly developed a theory that two people enter the house. One used a pillow to muffle her screams, while a second person stabbed her in the neck. What puzzled police was why. Valuables were untouched, including her wallet. But one thing that was missing was Louise's personal diary a book that could hold clues to why someone wanted her dead. Rumors about who killed her and why started flying around the small community where she lived. Her gold chains, her jewelry, and uh, they didn't take that or uh, good TV that she had. They didn't take anything, just her life. Digno Rodriguez works on the ranch. He says he told police Louise was threatened just days before she was killed. The only one who ever threatened her was the only one was the gringo. Nobody else. Everybody loved her. Everybody loved her here. 
That gringo he's talking about is another Canadian. This man, by the name of Bob Desotel. Rumor had it Bob was blaming Louise for the death of his friend. He was like insane, like thinking that the fault was of my mother. But it wasn't, it was an accident. And that's like after he went just crazy with that. How did your mother respond? My mom was scared. Bob Desotel, a Montreal artist, spent part of the year in the Dominican. Bob and Louise were friends. For a time, Bob even lived in a cottage behind Louise's home. But when Bob's friend, Louise Bonilla, died, that all changed. Bonilla was a local who got by doing odd jobs and construction work. He was electrocuted while he was doing some work moving power wires on Louise's ranch. And some say Bob Desotel was pointing the finger for his death straight at Louise. And he told her, well, you see, since he's dead, you will, you will not live long. And two weeks before her death, Louise sent an email to her son Tommy. I hope not to see Bob, she wrote. He is capable of making a scene. If Bob was blaming Louise for Bonilla's death, nobody else was. 16 by 9 tracked down Bonilla's sister, Lucrecia. She told us her brother's death was no one's fault and was nothing more than an accident. None of us, we don't think it, it is related. None of us ever thought about harming her or anything like that, actually. What happened was that she asked him to go ahead and help her put in some wires for this very poor lady who needed electricity. So we don't think it was related. It's just bad luck. Just bad luck. But according to police reports, Bob Desotel was taking a far less charitable position. He was encouraging Bonilla's family to sue Louise. And, according to Natalie, Louise was getting messages from a very angry Bob. I don't like you because of you, my friend died. She was astonished. She was, you know, why he's sending this, all this message? Why he's talking to me like that? Just two weeks later, Louise Gaudreau was stabbed to death in the bathroom of her home. She was so nice, so friendly with everybody. And she had a heart and she knew everything about Dominican, about life, about reality. She was like somebody very pure. Coming up on 16 by 9. We don't know what they've done. Right? <sighs> From the autopsy report, if we see what they've done, nothing. We don't even have the time of that. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. An anguished family searching for answers to a senseless murder. Who would want to kill this vibrant woman and why? Here again is our Robin Gill. April 2nd, 2010, Canadian Louise Gaudreau is murdered at her Dominican Republic horse ranch. Months after the murder in a Vancouver suburb, Louise's sister, Annie Toffini, pours over the police reports, looking for clues. It's like half of my heart is gone. Annie lost that half of her heart the day she got a phone call with the terrible news that her sister had been stabbed to death. Annie and her husband, Yuri, left immediately for the Dominican. We got to the farm that was, um, nothing was being done, no fingerprint. No fingerprinting. No fingerprinting, no nothing. And in the middle of it all, police informed Annie she had to pick up her sister's body from the morgue because they had no room to store it. In a panic and with little choice, Annie had her sister's body cremated. I think that's the biggest mistake we did. A big mistake because without the body, there was no chance to gather forensic evidence. It was on the autopsy, they didn't let them. They didn't even cut nail. They didn't... We don't know what they've done. Right? <sighs> From the autopsy report, we see what they've done, nothing. They don't even have the time of that. Annie stayed on for 18 days, witnessing, she says, one police bungle after another. 18 days of uh, held in corruption. <laughs> I don't know what to say it. Yeah, like we had to deal with um, not only my sister being a murderer, we have to deal with our us doing our own investigation, telling the police what to do with what we found. One of those things they say they told police was that a man was bad-mouthing Louise around town, 
saying she should pay for the death of Bonilla. That man, according to Annie, was Bob Day's hotel. He was making a big deal of it and, and talking, bad modding her. He was um, calling her and saying, like, um, that's your fault if he died. Finally, under pressure from Annie, the police brought Bob in. Annie confronted him at the police station. I was kind of uh, upset there. And he told me that um, my sister, everything that happened to her, she deserved that. That he was mad at her and she deserved to pay. Um, he was saying that the only mistake he, he did that was opening his big mouth. The police did not lay charges and after two days, they let Bob go. Incredibly, Bob gave them his motorcycle in exchange for getting his passport back. And the very next day, Bob got on a plane to Montreal, leaving the Dominican and the investigation far behind. For months, Annie heard nothing about the investigation into her sister's murder. So with no progress in the case, Annie is trying to piece things together on her own. She knows Dominican police seized Louise's cell phone, a computer and a camera as evidence. But police didn't take this. It's the bloody watch her sister was wearing the night she was murdered. When I saw it, the only thing that came to my mind, like, it's in a plastic bag just full of blood on it. And I thought DNA. I'm thinking I have to bring that back home and try to do a DNA test on it. Since Dominican police didn't test the DNA, Annie says she's going to, hoping it will lead to a break in the case. But something else that could lead to a break is missing a diary Louise used religiously to detail her day. Everybody knows she write everything because she, she used to have a book for the farm where she write everything, every, every, every single thing. It was no secret that she wrote in her diary every day. It wasn't a secret for people that knew her. 16 by 9 went to the Porto Plata police station to find out what they had uncovered and what they knew about the diary that could hold clues to her murder. The man in charge refused to speak to us on camera, but off camera, he admitted he didn't know anything about a diary. A diary would be an excellent piece of information because if somebody keeps a diary, if you have an argument, you'll have it there. If you solve that argument, you'll have it there too. So as a piece of evidence, it would be an excellent source of information. And he told us something else. He claims the case is ongoing, but Dominican police have no hard evidence to link anyone to Louise's murder. Until they finish the case, they find a conclusion to it, they will not close the case. So 16 by 9 returned to the scene of the crime to see if we could get some answers there. We found Officer Sergio Victoria on the case. Let me ask you this. You've been here months and months after this woman was killed. What did you accomplish today? Uh, the other I, I cannot say. I am really sorry. Do you have any suspects at all? Mientras tanto, ¿te tiene algún sospechoso? I cannot tell you. Is the Canadian still a suspect? El señor canadiense todavía es sospechoso? No luck getting information about developments here either. That was the entrance. So Annie, Yuri, and Tommy decided to try another route and head to the capital, Santo Domingo, for a meeting with Canada's consular officials. They know I'm not going away. I've been putting so much pressure that I'm not going away, and I'm not going to go away. My Be sister was worth fighting for. The Canadian consulate refused to let 16 by 9 in, but after a meeting that lasts more than an hour, Annie and Yuri emerged to tell us the news. The investigation is a current murder investigation. What is Canada doing? Putting pressure on the Dominican Republic to get this thing dealt with. We put in a request to speak to someone at the Canadian Embassy about the kind of pressure they're putting on the Dominican Republic. But well, we spoke to the ambassador and he said while he can give interviews to local press, he can't to Canadian press and referred the matter to Ottawa. But we didn't have any better luck getting answers in Canada's capital. The Department of Foreign Affairs sent us this email claiming privacy issues and saying consular officials are providing all appropriate assistance to Miss Gaudreau's family. The family of murdered Canadian Louise Gaudreau begs to differ, saying what the Canadian government is doing to help them is an awful long way from appropriate assistance. Well, nothing's happened. I mean, she's not being investigated in Dominican Republic. She's not being investigated in Canada. 
Canada's bureaucracy is about as thick as Dominicans corruption and we're we're in limbo where nothing's happening still to come on 16 by 9 based on what I've seen I still re remain confident that it's still a very solvable case every one of these documents that you read they just keep pointing right back here to, to Bob that's all coming up Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. Six months after Luis Godreau's murder, and no suspect, no charges, and no closure for her grieving family. But 16 by 9 investigated and found a crucial part of this case being ignored. Here is Robin Gill with a conclusion to Murder in Paradise. Six months after the murder of Canadian Louise Gaudreau in the Dominican Republic, no charges have been laid in the case. Down in the Dominican, they don't have answers for who killed Louise. So 16 by 9 decided to take the details of the case to Canadian homicide experts. The only thing that would really assist us from this point is to have uh, a good look at all of the uh, autopsy photographs and the crime scene photographs to tie it back in. But uh, that's a very, very... Uh, Big vague and short yeah. uh, autopsy report. And she found on the bathroom floor. Right? Yeah. This is Dave Perry and this is Ron Retham. They are former homicide detectives with more than 25 years experience working on high profile murders. Within minutes, they point out holes in the case. This is the one, um, this is an issue as well. That there's no indication under signs of sexual abuse, either yes or no. Yeah, that's a problem. So we have to question what evidence was gathered at the scene. So, if we could just go back to when it happened in April of 2010, pick that up and plant it right here in Canada, and especially in the GTA, or any other major center in this country, this is a very solvable case. Um, based on what I've seen, I still re remain confident that it's still a very solvable case. In almost no time, Perry points to a potential suspect. Every one of these documents that you read, they just keep pointing right back here to to Bob. He's talking about Bob Desotel, the man Dominican police held for questioning for two days and then let go. The man who gave police his motorcycle to get his passport back and then left the Dominican for Canada. There's just too much information here for us to ignore. This is not a, a case where it's a big mystery. But in the Dominican, at least, the case remains a big mystery. In July, Dominican police called Bob Day's hotel a person of interest, but no arrest order was issued. Then on August 14th, that changed. 16 by 9 obtained this copy of an arrest order issued by the Dominican police for Bob Day's hotel and two others, a Chilo and a Juan. But it seems that order comes too late. Bob has long since left the Dominican behind, leaving the house he built, a close circle of friends, and even an alibi. The alibi won't give her name, but says she was with Bob the night of Louisa's murder. Tell me about the night that Louisa was killed. Where were you and, and where was Bob? Having supper with my friend Yvette and with Bob des Hotel. And what was he like that night? Bob was, was crying all the time. He was so sad. But that dinner alibi has a hole. Listen while she tells us what time Bob left that night. And after he went to bed uh, into uh, his house around 11. She says Bob left dinner at 11 p.m. The police report puts the time of death between 5 p.m. and midnight. But still, she insists Bob didn't kill Louise. Some people in the town say he's responsible for Louise's death. Yeah. What do you say about that? But, uh, some people said that he's responsible because he was saying she's got to pay for it, but he didn't mean she had to pay of her life. 16 by 9 wanted to track down Bob Day's hotel to find out if he had anything to say about the circumstances surrounding Louise Gaudreau's murder. We finally found him on this Montreal street, just outside his apartment building. Day's hotel refused to answer any questions and rode off on his bicycle. But he did talk to a 16 by 9 producer by phone, insisting he had nothing to do with the murder. I didn't do it. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. and I, I won't go in front of the TV to, to tell everyone that, you know, I didn't commit a murder. 
and Desotel says his talk about making Louise pay was about financial compensation for his friend's death. He didn't mean murder. You know, I realized that it was an accident. You know, I was really upset. And it was a, a reaction normal to say that she has to pay for that. The way I was saying it, it means more or less, you know, ah, she got to pay, you know, like not with her life. She's got to pay money. Desotel says he won't go back to the Dominican Republic because the police are corrupt and he's being framed. They will arrest me and they're not interested in what I have to say. All they are interested is to get some more money from me. And Desotel says he doesn't even know about this arrest order. If they had something against me, I would have known now. The police would have contacted Canada and ask for my deportation or things like that. They have nothing against me. Foreign Affairs continues to insist it can't comment on this case and wouldn't even confirm if the department was aware of this arrest order. By the way, there is no extradition treaty between Canada and the Dominican Republic. And the RCMP says it has no jurisdiction to carry out an investigation in another country. But this politician, Liberal MP Dan McTagg says, Canada can do something. It is not unusual for the Canadian government to say, given you have this, uh, is there any need for assistance? There is one thing Foreign Affairs is required to do. Provide information about the investigation to the family. But this family didn't hear about the arrest order from the government. We told them. That is very frustrating news for the sister of the murdered Canadian. He let him go and then he got to Canada and this question has that's it. Seven months after Louise's murder, Annie ventures back to the ranch where her sister was killed. I think feeling close to her. I always liked the ranch and I still do like the ranch. The only thing missing is Louisa. When you first came back, what was it like walking into the house? It's still hard. Like, I, I, it's hard to explain because I have mixed feelings. I'm walking feeling like she's going to be here. Louise's ashes are in her bedroom and a shrine has been created to house her remains. So you realize she's really gone. And that's hard. Still, the family is no closer to knowing who killed Louise Gaudreau. Will you ever get closure? Closure, the only thing I know right now is still a hurt like hell. Like part of them, it's physical. The pain is physical. It's not just, it's like part of me is gone. And that's it for us tonight. If you have a story idea, just call us at 1-877-TELL-69 or visit our website at global16by9.com. I'm Mary Garofalo. Thank you for watching. And from all of us here, good night. If you've got a story idea for 16 by 9, call our tip line. Sixteen by nine, the bigger picture. That's a wrap.